Hello there, and welcome back to the Chaps Guide. My name is Ash, and of course I'm your host on this journey through men's style, self-development, and personal grooming. And today, something a little bit different. I've got an interview with a gentleman who works within the men's fashion, or I never use the word fashion, I hate that, style world. So I nearly went in the wrong direction there, but style world. So today I'm joined by Ryan, and um, he has a, a business, a custom clothier business, and we'll explore that. But I know all of you will be interested to to find out more about somebody who's involved in the men's style journey, um, who creates clothing for other people as well. So first of all, I'll say welcome. Hello, Ryan. Good to meet you. How are you? Great. Yes, well, welcome well. to the Chaps Guide. Thanks for having me. I haven't had uh, an interview with um, a guest for a long time, so it's a great pleasure to be here. And I should tell the folks as well that Ryan lives in Northampton, which is, of course, I'm sure most of you will know, the home of the finest men's shoes in the world. So we are in a place which is steeped in history when it comes to men's style. So it's really great to be here and to have a chat about you. Now, as I say, you know, when it comes to discovering about somebody's backstory, uh, I think there's only one question I can ask you, and that is, Tell me a bit about yourself. You know, where, where does it all originate for you? So I think probably like a lot of guys out there, um, we probably all go through a transition in our life where we want to change something maybe for the better. Um, and for me, um, it was, I think I was about 23 years old and I decided that I needed to change from where I was. So I grew up very much... Um, in the mountain biking scene. Uh, so it was you know, baggy jeans, it was fox racing t-shirts, it was you know, a little bit sort of of a, a, a sort of punk vibe if, if you like. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm moving through life and I want to open other doors and see a, a different side of things which won't be accessible to me if I continue on this path of looking like a bit of a, a bit of a punk. So um, so it was it was partly that and i started where most people go youtube oh right yeah so um and and that is where i sort of went on this self self-development um journey um, through you know all the big youtubers that you've seen uh, i think this was around about 2010 um and that's where i learned um and started to develop yeah and as i moved through um i found a real love for it and i saw a real positive change in how I was perceived by other people as well. Mm. Um, and so I really used style actually as a, as a tool. That's, a, that's interesting that even at that relatively young age, you know, your early 20s, you recognised and understood that the way that you presented yourself would have an impact on the way people treated you. And did, did you notice that when you started dressing differently? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, it became a little bit of a uniform and uh, you know I would practice talking to different people and in every scenario um, people perceive me I, I can give you one example where well I, I really it really hit home so I started a new job obviously I was dressed to the nines and I was I was out uh, in the business and um, one of the managers from another business came across to us and I was standing with the general manager and this other chap that needed something from us, he came and spoke to me while the general manager was showing me around. And I thought, why has he come over and spoke to me? And why does he think I'm the one with the authority here? And I think it's because I'm probably outdressing the general manager. Absolutely, yeah. And that was when I thought, wow, this really works. There's power or in clothing. It's confirmed it. Yeah, yeah. there's power in clothing. No. I understand, I know, because we've had a chat before, that we share a history in more formal uniform. So I was RAF, you were in the army. How has your military background influenced your thoughts about style and how you dress today? Yeah, you know, the army, you're taught to dress in a certain way and the army loves straight lines. Um, so, you know, putting on that, you're putting on that uniform like 
like a lot of soldiers do for the first time and they really feel like part of something and they really feel sort of proud to be wearing that and you know the British Army is like no exception to having you know uniforms that are absolutely out there as well um, <laughs> so I, th I think I saw the power of that um, and if you look at you know troops marching you'll see that there's power there and that's what it portrays and that's why these these things are done there's a kinship I think when you wear the same uniform as other people and it's just like you know where you and I might wear a sports jacket or something where somebody else may wear you know a, a sweatshirt when you're in uniform I think you take pride in keeping it in a certain way don't you like ironing your trousers I mean when I came here today you said I've just finished my ironing yeah and you know how many men enjoy ironing today and I, I do you told me you did I think that's part of the sort of hangover of military life isn't it yeah it's, it's, it's maintaining my wardrobe as well because I'm looking at all these things as an investment um, so you know at the end of the week uh, if I can manage to get to there it, it usually happens in between uh, you know I do all my ironing I hang it all up um, I, I'm the only one that irons them I don't <laughs> trust anyone else like like most soldiers when they go to basic training they'll they'll iron for four hours a night uh, get in their locker just perfect for it to be destroyed the next morning um, unfortunately um, I know what you mean I mean I've been married 16 years and my wife has never ironed an item of clothing for me I mean she does iron the linen the bed clothes but she doesn't iron a, an item which I wear on my body because I iron all my own stuff but uh, and, and for me it's all about being self-reliant as well yeah. um, and I, I, I want to wake up in the morning I want to go to my wardrobe and I want to be able to I want to, everything to be ready and ready to go with no pressure um, and everything to to work together as much as it can absolutely and i gotta say you're a very dapperly dressed gentleman thank you i <laughs> love the jacket you're wearing actually i do love double breasted um would you would you describe this as a blazer yeah that's a blazer yeah, isn't it's it blazer. yeah it's a nice blazer okay so you um operate a custom clothier called Greyland. yes tell me about that Where, what's the story behind that then so um once i left the military i uh decided that I really saw a an opportunity within sort of menswear um, and originally I actually trained as an image consultant and while I was doing a lot of research for that I came across a company that were offering a um, tailoring business franchise um, and you know I would effectively be a a rep I would sell their products and I thought this is great I could, I could put a service together and I could put a product together um, the product absolutely went off I you know I had I couldn't really keep up I had so much so, it was so busy I had no real time to, to do the sort of the image consultancy stuff that I planned on I really enjoyed it um, I sort of traveled around Birmingham and Cambridge Milton Keynes uh, Northamptonshire and it was wonderful However, my franchisers were not so keen on the customer service that I wanted to, to give my customers. Um, and I felt they were a little bit more about, they worried about their cash flow rather than their customers, uh, which I know as a business is yeah. important. Laws of economy. Yeah, yeah. but um, so I actually left. I uh, terminated my contract, I left. Uh, and I approached another company and said, look, let me, um, uh, work for you in the, the UK uh, as your rep um, they said yes I said great uh, but they weren't brilliant at paying their bills <laughs> um, so I also left that I then I took a couple of years out thinking maybe this industry and when, um, when I say the industry I mean made to measure um, rather than sort of you know the higher end bespoke things um, maybe it wasn't for me so I took two years out and then I decided I'd, I'd go out on my own and do it my way and look after my, pe like my customers properly and give them an experience rather than just a product. Yeah. Um, and so I started just before the pandemic, which was brilliant timing. <laughs> Couldn't be better. <laughs> um, and uh, so I sort of had to weather that storm for, for a little bit until the, the pandemic uh, sort of passed us by. A lot of people obviously working from home so not a great deal of suits need, being needed. 
No. Also, um, the other sort of the biggest industry was the wedding industry with, you know, grooms and ushers and things like that. Also, all, all the weddings turned off now. So, uh, yeah, it was a so it went tricky couple of years. Totally flat. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I, uh, yeah, questioned myself a little bit. I was like, this is the wrong time. Um, but as things have, have now opened, and uh, I think we're coming from people who have been wearing a tracksuit for the last couple of years, and actually, we can only go up, mm. you know, in terms of um, yeah, well, dressing better. I've seen a lot of data recently, because I, I love to read sort of the business um, publications, and there's a lot of suggestion that suit sales are bouncing back, I think 40% in the last... 12 months and as people are now being called back into work in offices from working from home for these last um, couple of years three years almost now isn't it you know so hopefully you'll start to see a bounce back so how, how does it work then so say for instance I'm interested in a new suit how how do you operate how does it work so um, you just you go on the website you book an appointment um, I I'll give you a call uh, or an email and, and do a bit of a fact-finding um, mission to find out what it is you're looking for, when you need it for, um, what sort of like climate it's going to be in, just to cover those bases before I come out to you to make sure one that you want to get something from me and that we're a good match, uh, and two that you're going to buy something that's going to be an investment rather than um, something that's not going to work for you later on. So um, it's really about finding out what's important and making sure it's it's fit for that um, and then actually you come out to the customer the client um, we'll sit down we'll look through fabrics we shall design it we'll choose options uh, we'll measure we'll look at body proportions and angles so like shoulder pitch you know back shape things like that uh, once we've, we've all measured it we'll um, I then take the order and then put that through now I don't I don't make them myself like the majority of um, custom clothiers who don't. You know, we use a manufacturing uh, system where uh, we input the orders, they then arrive, and then we'll come out to the client, fit them, and then we'll look where we can alter them to get a better fit if needed, and uh, take it away, get that work done, bring it back, and uh, hopefully it should be, um, it should be uh, ready to go. Yeah. The, the difference is, is where I'm trying to do a hybrid of online, so you get the benefit of the price and convenience of online, Yeah. but you still get that personal touch where you get to touch the fabric and, mm. and speak to somebody if you're a little unsure of whether, you know, am I choosing the right lapel width for my chest size? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been through um, online tailoring experiences. So I've had suits made by Hockerty, Oliver Wicks, a um, couple of companies like that. and. I was satisfied largely, but it did feel like a shot in the dark. And one of them needed extensive retailering when it arrived, which took ages. <clears throat> you know, it, was, it would have been a total bust if I um, was depending on that suit for that mm -hmm. sort of set event. So I can see how having the human contact and having somebody who's uh, experienced in that field can help you in the process. It's almost like made to measure plus isn't it you know yeah because having because um, I've, I've been through this experience with you you've measured me for a sports jacket and I remember you know the questions you asked me uh, were quite expansive and it did feel like uh, you know I'd gone on a journey with you for you to discover exactly everything you needed to know about me to make sure the garment was perfect so I can see how it's an additional sort of entirely different element to buying something from something like Hockerty, which to be quite frank, you know, you're ticking boxes. You don't really know what that means until the garment turns up and then it's too late. You're disappointed. Yeah. So I think also, you know, clothing is very, it's very personal. So slim fit to one person is completely different to another. Mm. So what I do is I'm, I actually bring out what I call a master model. So I, I actually put a suit on uh, the client and then I can actually adjust that suit to their preferences. What this means is, is they can almost visualize the fit and what it will look like um, and, and the feel of it. And it will give us a much better idea so that when the suit is made, we have much less alterations that need to be made. So it's mm. a quicker process. 
Um, and, and of course, you know, I have those alterations done. It's not like you are given a 125 pound credit to go and find a tailor to, to fix it for you. Um, so it takes away that, that extra work yeah. because I, we don't want to create more I remember work that because when I had my suit altered, I was told to go to a tailor who would do it for me and they were 30 miles away from where I lived. And I had to make two trips to that tailor and it was a real inconvenience. Yeah. So what you do is you take all of that burden away. Yeah, so I, I, don't, run a, I don't run a shop front. And the idea with that is, is that, um, you know, the customers aren't paying for that shop front within their clothing, so they can get sort of an online price, um, but they can still get an in-person service. It's fantastic. So I should say, all right, so I know a lot of people watching this are from the United States, all right, and other parts of the world. So this is a service which was provided in England. Yes. So at the moment, until Greyland, Greyland expands internationally, we're currently in England talking about this. So, you know, yeah. I hope that hasn't disappointed any of you in Arizona there or anywhere else or in Vancouver. In time, you might see uh, Ryan over there, but at the moment it's an England only service. So um, it's really discovering more about the mindset of somebody who works in what is essentially sort of cutting edge of, of men's style business these days. You know, there aren't, I guess, uh, many people who do this because it's, um, although it seems to be on the bounce back, it has been an industry in decline, hasn't it, for the last yeah. couple of decades. So hopefully that'll change. So I did have some other questions for you to try and yeah. sort of learn more about you. Um, who would you say, all right, is the best dressed man that you can think of? I'm, I'm thinking now, if I was to say, pick me an icon, somebody who you would aspire to look like, or their style, you know, that really rings bells for you? So I think as I've been on this journey for, um, when I sort of seriously been on this journey over the last sort of 15 years, um, it's definitely, it's definitely those, those, those goalposts have moved. Mm. Um, and, and where I am now, I feel like I really fit. I've gone for a little more of a traditional English style, but not so traditional that I'm looking at having pleats or, or things like this, just because I'm still quite young-ish, <laughs> quite trim still. Um, so I've always loved, uh, in sort of like celebrities wise, I've always thought Colin Firth was always really yeah, well dressed. Yeah. And Kingsman, all that sort the of thing. Kingsman, uh, even in, you know, Bridget Jones with those horrific jumpers. He, he still pulled them off. Um, he did. He's about six foot four, though, isn't he? So yeah. he's got like a towering presence. So um, I've always uh, I've liked that sort of uh, style. Not so much. Um, like the Kingsman is really elevated. Yeah, double breasted, isn't it? And yeah. Um, but I've always found his style to be, um, you know, and the casual side as well. Sort of when he's um, at the sort of the parties and stuff is always very consistent. You know, the overcoat. I've always, I've always liked that because I've always felt it, it portrayed power uh, and success. Classic um, elegance. Classic, classic elegance. elegance. And in fairness, I think all of their suits were made by Huntsman, weren't they? So, I think so yeah. the most expensive bespoke tailor on Savile Row. So, uh, probably six thousand pounds a suit there. Yeah, so not cheap. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not quite that expensive. But then I, I don't, I don't claim to have the expertise. At that. No, no, I, I can get, I get where you're coming from. You know, that style is timeless isn't it you know we'll be looking back at that style in fact when he played the role that he won his oscar for um the our late queen's father mm. the, yes. the king with a speech problem um the suits he wore in that probably looked very similar to the ones in kingsman didn't they double breasted classical style and they hadn't aged you know in 50 yeah. years 60 years or whatever if you buy a suit of that nature in a contemporary fashion it's never going to go out of date and, and i think because when you're buying things you know we all look at clothing and it, and especially when you start looking at suits and blazers, you know, they, they cost a lot of money. Mm. And so we, I, I really, it's really important that I think of them as an investment. So I have things that you know are 10 years old and they still work. Um, and I think they'll continue to work for me for the next uh, 10 to 15 yeah. years, as, as long as I can. As long as we can space, fit into it. I know I'm, com enough. I'm coming to that age now where I've got to think carefully about, you know, don't get something too snug because you never know. <laughs> <laughs> this time next year, I might have two inches on the waist. Always endeavour not to, of course, but there we go. Yeah, so I think it's just about being 
being for me it's about being consistent uh, and not following following sort of the trends that you see on tv uh, i see a lot of a lot of guys these days they love leggings as yeah. jeans um yeah and uh, i think when you get to 30 it's, it's it, it can be a little bit oh yeah yeah I, I, that's one of my <laughs> pet hates is this style of, of recent years is buying everything two sizes too small not one size too small two sizes too small and i think it's because guys like to have this um they like to show off their physiques don't mm. they if they've got them and it just makes you look as if you've gained a load of weight very quickly or you're wearing your your little brother's suit and it just i don't think it works at all <laughs> yeah i mean we all see yeah uh, in the movies uh usually the the power player the the man amongst men is usually dressed in a way that says i am the the alpha male here if you, if you like for yeah. that expression um absolutely well i mean the classic is daniel craig in james bond mm -hmm. right so i mean i i really connected better with the pierce brosnan era where he had yeah. really lovely cut suits yeah me too Daniel Craig, of course, is dressed by um, Tom Ford, and they must sew him into the suits. There is no, I mean, he's meant to be a, a, a spy, and there's no room for dynamic movements in his clothes. The jacket looks as if it's going to burst if he yeah. breathes in deeply. The trousers are sort of skin tight to his thigh, and, you know, he's, he has to keep himself in the same size every day. And, and Piers Brosnan is probably one of my other um, sort of style icons, even out of uh like the james bond franchise and into sort of his normal life it, he always looks brilliant mm. and quite classical you know another movie i forget um the, the name of it i think it's called love punch oh yeah and uh, again he's dressed much more casually but really well and i grew up on pierce Brosnan. um and yeah i found when daniel craig came along i was like everything's everything's very tight um you know everyone talks about that dreaded x in the jacket yeah yeah um i'm also not quite sure why a, a british spy from is actually going over to america to have his suits made but but in fairness <laughs> in fairness he does buy his shoes from your town and he does, Crockett yeah. And, Jones. Yeah, he does. and i think uh pierce brosnan was a church man so he's your town as well isn't it churches are here too aren't yeah they? yeah they're all there so at least you've got the bond connection there yeah <laughs> <laughs> right well i mean i don't know how long we've been chatting for we're probably coming up to our time um thank you so much for joining me today and giving us an insight into what's in the mind of somebody who actually works in delivering the dreams of men because you know I, I guess when everybody thinks of themselves wearing a suit we think of ourselves as smart elegant and actually when you go into a shop and try it on that doesn't always happen no. but with somebody who's able to give advice and guidance as you do through Graylin uh that that actually gets delivered for us so thank you for your insights today and uh, thank you very much for listening um i hope you've enjoyed the video i'll catch up with you later hello there folks welcome back to my office we have magically leapt 150 miles south and i just wanted to close the video off by saying i hope you enjoyed my conversation with uh, ryan i was up there yesterday had a great chat with him and i hope it gave you an insight really into the mind of somebody who is a custom clothier who works within the men's style world uh, to help us dress our very best and to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be when it comes to the clothes that we decide for ourselves to to present to the world so if you did enjoy that video i would of course encourage you to let me know in the comments because if you like the interview format i'll try and get some other folks in and we'll have some more interviews um, don't forget give it a thumbs up if you'd like to uh, subscribe and see more like that, click the old red button down in the bottom. And if you'd like to support the channel and help me fund these expeditions around the country, you can either buy me a coffee or even become a patron because I now have a patron account. And on there, I actually provide additional content, videos and audio content for my patrons who are greatly appreciated and help bring you this material wherever you are. So until the next time, take care and I will see you again very soon.